Well, why don't you please turn in God's Word to the book of Hebrews. And while you're turning there, just a few comments. Uh, firstly, to all of our visitors um, who wouldn't have known to have brought some bread and some uh, juice of some kind, uh, uh, please forgive us um, not being able to accommodate you in, in, any, in, in the normal way we would. Um, fortunately, with the COVID restrictions and the, all the parameters around that, it does make it uh, difficult, but in no way reflects uh, our uh, opinion of you. If you are a believer in Christ, you know, we, we count you part of the great body of Christ, and so um, there's not any intent to exclude you, so please do understand that. Uh, secondly, for those that are regular, you may be wondering why we're in Hebrews and not Revelation this morning. Uh, well, um, in Revelation, we, we would be coming to a, a complex section that involves uh, the beast, and it occurred to me that uh, the beast rising out of water might not be an appropriate image for a, a baptismal service. So um, I kind of took the decision to bypass that and focus on something else instead, which I'm sure you understand. And then uh, thirdly, uh, I apologize for, for those of you that are concerned about such things, that I have creases in my shirt this morning. I accidentally left my jacket on the chair as I was rushing out the door. Uh, but do comfort yourself with the knowledge that John the Baptist himself was wearing camel's hairs, I think. And, and so, um, so I, think, I think I'm on safe ground to say that it's not going to hinder the preaching of God's Word, and let us not let it hinder our reception of it either by needless distractions. So uh, with those uh, comments aside, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to make the introduction before I actually read the text. But Hebrews chapter 1 is where we'll be. So let, let's bow our heads in prayer now. Almighty God, we do give thanks to you again for this service. We give thanks, Lord, that those of us who are in Christ, we, we're part of a great family, Lord, that we are brothers and sisters to one another, that you are our Father in heaven. And what a joy it is to be able to meet and to share and to laugh and to weep with one another at times and to sit together and to unite our hearts in worship. And to that end, Father, we do pray that this time that we come to now would know your blessings so that our worship is pleasing to you, even in the hearing and preaching of your word. Help me, I pray, uh, help us all in the spirit of John the Baptist who, who said that Christ must increase and I must decrease. Lord, may that be our spirit as we come to you now, as we come to your word. So bless us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning you've witnessed the baptism of five Christian men and women giving public testimony to their faith in the Son of God. They didn't do it to boast of anything in themselves. Uh, truth be told, they, they probably didn't really want the attention it brought to them. They were, they were nervous, and un understandably so. But they did it in simple obedience to the command of Jesus Christ and out of love for the triune God who has worked to save them. And so they went through the waters of baptism willingly. They went through at their own request. Now I know that perhaps you are expecting a sermon on baptism as a result, and especially if you're visiting, because isn't that what Baptists do? They, they talk about baptism all the time. It's always, it's always about water and so on. It, 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 that might be what you're thinking. But if you were to talk to any of our regulars, you would find that it's not the case. It is a conviction we have, but it's not a platform that we campaign on, though some Baptist churches might do that. Uh, but we see baptism as a signpost. And like any signpost, it points somewhere. You don't make too much of the signpost itself, though you are excited to see it along the way, and though it, it has a very important function in the life of the church. But you, you don't settle there. You don't do that, you make much rather of the destination the thing to which the sign is pointing. And the baptism of these five believers is pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ, is pointing us to His work on the cross, His resurrection, His power to forgive sins. And for those that were baptized, it was also a visible picture of their experience of the forgiveness of sins. Long before they were baptized, long before they went through this public act, the forgiveness that they had received through faith in the good news because of God's grace to them in using their godly parents or using friends or using others to communicate to them 
the gospel of our Lord and our God. And that going under the water and coming up again, it was a visual representation of what had already happened, an outward, outward sign of an inward change. It was a picture of Romans 6 verse 4. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into a death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead to glory, by, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So that, that's what you've seen this morning. You've seen the sign. You've seen the picture of their past experience of forgiveness through faith. So not wanting to focus any further on the sign, let me draw your attention to the one to whom the sign points by looking just at these opening verses of Hebrews chapter 1. Look with me now as we read. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, uh, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And building from those verses, the rest of the book, which might seem and appear complicated, builds a very, very simple case. The complete and utter supremacy of Jesus Christ. It's the message that the first readers of the, this book needed to hear. They, they were a group of first and second generation Jewish Christians. They were living in a multi multicultural, religiously diverse society like ours, but a society which, like ours, was becoming increasingly hostile to the exclusive and public claims of Christianity. The temptation for those first readers then was to, to take the easier path, to revert back to their Jewish faith, something which back then attracted less persecution. And though that might not be precisely your or my temptation, that the root of it is the same. Uh, the temptation to blend in and go with the flow, to tone down your faith, to bow the knee to the narrative that is coming from the world, to fit in, to believe what it believes, and, and uh, say only what it says instead of what Scripture says. But then along comes a book like Hebrews, w written to wavering and hesitating and fearful Christians, and it effectively asked the question, why would you turn your back on so great a God and Savior as Jesus Christ? Why would you even think about leaving the path? Christ is God's greatest and final revelation to the world. There is nothing more to come beyond Him. That, that, that's what that's why the author's opening uh, with these words the way that he is. He's, he's going to be leading us into an argument that says, don't look back to the old ways. Don't look back to your past life. Don't miss it. Don't look wistfully into past traditions. Don't envy. Don't fear the surrounding culture. Don't turn your back on the utterly supreme Jesus Christ. And here's three points that I'm going to give you now just to work our way and carry us through the text. First point, verse 1 in the past, God spoke by the prophets. Quick and easy now. In the past, God spoke to the forefathers of these Jewish Christians through prophets. Moses was a prophet. Jeremiah was a prophet. Malachi was a prophet. And many more named and unnamed. God spoke to them and through them in many ways, in many times over the centuries. As Samuel spoke to Saul, as Nathan spoke to David as Jacob spoke to the, the sons of Israel on his deathbed, as Daniel spoke to the people in Israel many, many times. And in many ways, he, they spoke words of judgment on Israel and Judah and the surrounding nations. They spoke words of hope uh, to those that were harassed and persecuted for their faithfulness. They spoke words of restoration to the exiles, and they spoke words of blessing to the remnant. Sometimes they spoke... God spoke using men like Isaiah, a nobleman, and sometimes he used men like Amos, a humble shepherd. Sometimes they had apoc apocalyptic visions of the future in Ezekiel, and sometimes they were accompanied by miracles like Elijah, sometimes with a measure of repentance, and other times increasing the hardening of those that heard. So, so many times and in many ways 
through the prophets, through the Old Testament, God has been speaking. But he never gave a complete revelation of himself. Always it was a glimpse, always it was a part, as if you were being allowed to see just a few millimeters of a great canvas painting that, that stretched the length of a museum. You, you only ever got to see bits and pieces. He never revealed his fullness. But then, second point, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. Now, I don't know if you remember the record of the transfiguration the time that Jesus took Peter and James and John up the side of the mountain alone, and uh, he was there um, outwardly transformed into this brilliant, dazzling figure, the white clothes radiating the glory of God, and, and there appeared alongside him uh, Moses and Elijah. I don't know if you remember that, that account. Uh, what, what happened next is actually very revealing, and it, we don't give enough cr credit to, to what the text is telling us, enough understanding to it. You know, Peter looks up and he looks to one side and he, and he sees Moses who gave the whole revelation of the law, or God gave it through Moses. And then Peter looks to the other side and he sees Elijah, the greatest miracle worker of all the prophets who came to represent all the prophets. And he thinks to himself, you know, wow, what, what, what a great team. We got the law, we got the prophets, we got Jesus. And he puts his foot in his mouth and he says, uh, let, let us put up three tents for you, Lord. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. And what happens next? What does the Bible say? Very interesting little phrase. He did not know what he was saying. Peter did not know what he was saying. And, and a cloud covers them and fear overcomes them, and then the voice of God himself speaks and says, this is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. I, I don't know if you get the point there. Jesus is not just another great man. He's not just another Moses, another Elijah, another Abraham, another David, another whomever. You can't just bunch them together with the rest and, and add them to the catalog of Old Testament prophets. No, this is God's Son. This is the fullness of God in bodily form. This is Jehovah in the flesh. This is the, the same Jesus this Jesus made the promise to Abraham. This, this Jesus gave the law to Moses, uh, chose David to be king, sent Jonah to Nineveh, who was the ancient of days, highly exalted and glorified in, in the book of Daniel. It's the same person, this glorious son. And we're in the last days, says Hebrews 1 to those first century Christians, and God has spoken to us by his son. So you know, don't, don't, don't turn, your, turn your back on him. And don't look elsewhere for God, because it doesn't get any better than this. And God has said all he's going to say through this Jesus Christ. You don't, don't seek for truth in other religions. Don't be fooled by the promised pleasures of sin and run after the world. Don't start looking for some inner light to guide you and navigate by a, a feeling or a sense or an impression. Don't run after so-called new prophecies or visions or dreams or gimmicks. Look to the Son. Be satisfied in Christ. Be satisfied with Christ and pursue Him experientially through a relational love and daily obedience and a prayerful reading of His words, the Holy Scripture, because it all points to Him. All the signs of Scripture lead there. Which brings us to the third point. The Son is supreme above all. And here in just two verses are the first seven reasons in the book of Hebrews why Jesus is superior, a superior revelation uh, to all previous revelations and all previous prophets. Seven diamonds in a crown, seven excellencies of Jesus Christ. Firstly, Jesus is the heir of all things. Now, next time you go home, have a look at all you possess. Do you own it? No, you don't. You're just a steward. You, you manage it. 
You're allowed to for a time before death or circumstance takes it away. Ultimately, all things are Christ's inheritance. Uh, Your house, your car, your collection of whatever it is that you love to collect and put in a cabinet. He is heir to all. He is heir to every island, every kingdom, every nugget of gold, every grain of sand. He is heir to every comet, every planet, every star in the galaxy, every galaxy in the whole universe. He is even heir to you. You belong to Him. Your soul is His. his. He is heir to the redeemed, those saved by grace, and and with whom He is pleased to share His inheritance one day. But He is also heir to the damned, those who reject His reign, and whom He Himself will cast into hell for eternity one day. He is heir to everything. He owns it all. Only Jesus Christ did not inherit all things through the death of his father or any other such nonsense. Rather, he secured his inheritance through his own death and resurrection and by virtue of the fact that he is the creator of all things in the first place. And that brings us to the second point. Jesus Christ is the one through whom the universe was made. He is the world's architect. He is the world's builder. That the very best scientist on their very best day with the very best equipment cannot create something out of nothing, cannot create life. At best, they can manipulate what God has already given them, what God has created out of God's inventory, if you like. But Christ can. He can and has created all matter, all physical and spiritual substance, visible and invisible. He creates New life in every pregnancy. His ingenuity designed the wonders of mathematics, the intricacies of science, the harmonies of music, the splashes of color in the arts, the seemingly inexhaustible number of of fauna and flora and the species of which we are still discovering. All the delightful varieties of food that rest upon your palate, He created it. This is Colossians 1. By Him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or rulers or powers or authorities, all things were created by Him and for Him. As Charles Spurgeon, a preacher from a hundred odd years ago, used to say, all the worlds are but sparks from the anvil of omnipotence. It's an amazing picture. You can picture this mighty anvil of infinite power hammer, hammer, hammering down on this anvil and, and the sparks flying out and creating the galaxies and the stars. That's who we're talking about here. This Jesus Christ through whom the universe was made. And then thirdly, Jesus Christ is the radiance of God's glory. You know, the, the glory of God is the It's the Godness of God. The glory of God is the Godness of God. It is His pure, uncreated, holy, and beautiful perfections, often simply just described in Scripture as being like light. Brilliant, blinding, dazzling, penetrating light. I mean, how else do you you define something that's such as the glory of God, the Godness of God? But now think back to the Old Testament and think for a moment of of what Hebrews actually gets to later, the the center of Old Testament worship. It was the the temple or the the tabernacle, the tent-like structure before it. And and inside there, there was the holy place. And further in, beyond the holy place, there was the most holy place behind the curtain. And in the middle of the most holy place, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and above the Ark of the Covenant, part of the, lid, the covering of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two golden angels. And between those two golden angels on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat, like the throne of Israel. And, and it was here that the, the glory of God would symbolically manifest, presence uh, Himself uh, in Israel. So that this Ark was the most holy artifact in all of the ancient world. As someone has said, you touch this Ark... And you die. And you lift the lid of this ark to look inside, and 50,000 people die. That's how seriously God takes his glory. 
this blazing purity, just too potent a thing for sinners to see, let alone live with. And there were all these sacrifices and the priesthood system designed to help Israel and us understand a very simple but deadly truth, God's glory is lethal to sinners. But then something incredible happened, something you read about in the Bible. John 1 verse 14, God became flesh and tabernacled among us, lived among us, dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, all that pure, uncreated, holy, beautiful perfection, all that radiant glory, all the godness of God, revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, you want to know what God is like? Look no further than Jesus Christ. Don't build your theology on your feelings or your imaginings or your desires. Build it on the revelation of Jesus Christ in these last days. He is the superior revelation, the greatest, because He is God Himself. Which brings us to the next point. Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of God's nature. And the word there is very descriptive. The the one that's been translated exact imprint, exact representation of God's being, I think other translations have. It's the same word for the, the wax impression that was left upon a sealed document. You've seen this in movies where someone takes a bit of wax that is usually dark red in color and they hold it over a flame and they drip it, they melted wax down onto the documents or onto the scroll or the envelope. And then the one that is gonna be sending this message takes his signet ring and he, and he pushes it into the wax or a stamp and he pushes it into the wax and he holds it there for a second allowing it to cool and harden in the shape of the, uh, the, the symbol upon the ring, usually a, a coat of arms or a crest of some sort. It, uh, it was represented, it was imprinted exactly into the molten wax so that when you receive the letter with that seal, you could tell immediately that it was truly from the person who claimed to send it. Now that term, exact representation or imprint, in verse 3, is the same word that Greeks use for that wax impression upon the, the letter. You look at the wax, you look at the seal, if they match, it's an exact representation and you know from whom it came. So what does it mean here in context, verse 3? It means that everything that God is, Jesus is. Everything that God is, Jesus is. He is not only one part of God's being. Jesus is not the compassion of God and the Father is the anger of God and the Spirit is the power of God. Jesus is not the 33% that came down to earth while 66.6 .6 recurring remained in heaven, no. Jesus is the fullness of God. Everything that God is, He is. I and the Father are one, as He said. And I don't know if you realize what this means. It means that you cannot say you love God and yet reject Jesus Christ. And you cannot say you love Jesus Christ and yet reject the God of the Old Testament. They are one and the same. You've seen Jesus, you've seen God. You've heard Jesus, you've heard God. You've embraced Jesus, you've embraced God. You reject Jesus, you've rejected God. The substance of God, the nature of God, is the substance and nature of Christ. Jesus is not a created being. He is not a junior God, a demigod. He is the God. And while there is a distinction in the members of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, there is no difference in his being. He is the same in substance. He is God. And that's why Colossians 2 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity of God lives in bodily form. And that brings us to the fifth one. Jesus Christ is sustaining all things by his powerful word. He, he keeps everything from unraveling. 
You know, he wrote the laws of physics, uses them, keeps them constant, and yet overrules them in, the, in history. He controls those things that we call probability, you know, determining the, the what and when and if and how of a matter. He manages the movements of weather and the cosmos. He prevents the disintegration of all matter into somatonic nothingness. He continually holds creation together. It is Christ that does these things. He has not wound up the whole universe and sort of just put it on a mantelpiece somewhere and, and left it ticking away and doing its own thing. No, he, he is the great conductor and everything moves in the symphony that he is orchestrating at everything follows his slightest command. If your hope is in Jesus Christ, you need not live in fear of a capricious whim of a mythical mother nature. Because it is not fate, it is not chance, it is not luck that controls the outcome of your life or creation. It is Christ. He sustains all things. And how does He do it? Verse 3, in the same manner in which He created all things in the first place, by His Word. He commands, tremble, and continental plates will shift and move. He calls, erupt. And volcanoes will spit forth their fiery magma. He declares fall. And rulers and nations crumble. He says live. And a baby is conceived in a mother's womb. And he says come. And the soul departs from the flesh to stand before him. He sustains all things. By the word of his power. And sixthly, Jesus Christ made purification for sins. It is estimated that at every Jewish celebration of the Passover, upwards of 250,000 lambs were slaughtered in Jerusalem. And that's, that's apart from all the other sacrifices made throughout the year. That's, and that's only for one year. To say nothing of the nearly 1,500 years of sacrificial system before that, this multitude of animal sacrifice, an ocean of blood spilt, and yet not, not one uh, sin was covered by it. There was no purification for sin. It wasn't enough. It was only the blood of an animal after all. And no matter how many animals were killed, it could not deal eternally with the problem of sin. Not even one, let alone all of us. But then a greater revelation came. The one to whom all the sacrifices were pointing. They came to us, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist pointed at him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus did what centuries of sacrifices and literally billions of animal deaths and generations of priests and high priests toiling in blood-soaked robes could not do. He made purification for sin. How? By offering up his own perfect life as a sacrifice for sinners like you and me upon a cross 2,000 years ago. He shed his own blood. His human blood. His divine blood and because of who he is and how he lived that sacrifice was entirely acceptable as a substitute and so seventh point Jesus Christ sat down the right hand of the majesty on high he sat down and that is significant Again, think back to that Old Testament, the temple, the tabernacle, and all the furniture that was inside. You had candelabras, menorahs, you had showbread table for the bread, you had an altar of incense, you had basins for washing, you had the altar of sacrifice, you had all these things, each with their uses, each designed and ordained by God. But one thing was missing, what was it? A chair. Somewhere to sit. Because it would never be appropriate for a priest whose work was incomplete to sit down in God's presence. 
because the sacrifices had to keep coming. The work was never finished. Year after year, generation after generation, the blood must flow on. The blood must flow on. The blood must flow on. But then, Jesus Christ made purification for sins. And so, he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high in the highest, most exalted, most eminent place, seated on the throne of heaven itself. And you can see what the Revelation, uh, what Hebrews is telling us. His work is complete. His work is sufficient. His death on the cross is eternally acceptable, never to be repealed, never to be repeated, never needing supplementing or change for those who trust in Him. For you or me to suggest or even to think that we can chip in, that we can add some well-earned points from some good, clean living that we can contribute with our own ideas of personal morality or that we can live well enough to add anything to this perfect sacrifice, it would be dangerous. It would be foolish. It would be futile in the extreme. If 250,000 slaughtered lambs in one day couldn't cut it, then neither will anything that you or I can bring. But there's the wonderful news. Jesus did it all. Jesus made the way. In a single act, he has secured for all time the eternal salvation of every sinner who shall come to trust in him, who shall put their faith in him. So he sat down in a position of glory and power and authority, and he's there right now, ruling, sustaining, judging, interceding, and saving as he prepares the world for his return. And that is what we want to be very clear about as we witness these baptisms. The baptisms were not adding to what Jesus has done. The baptisms were not a means by which we secure what Jesus has done, reach for it through water. No. The baptisms were only ever a, an expression of faith in what he has done. It is a declaring of the cross and the resurrection and our faith in that matter, a faith which we have before we go into the water. It's a declaration that he has saved sinners just like me. So have you uprooted your faith in everything else to save you, and have you planted it in Christ alone? Have you repented of your sins, turned from them, and turned to God, a lifelong process of turning, and called on his name to save your soul. Because there is no other way for you to be forgiven of your sin before this glorious and holy God. No other way but through Jesus Christ, exclusively and unapologetically alone. He is superior in every way to everything else. Which is where the book of Hebrews goes on. We just looked at the first seven points. There's many more. He is greater than the angels. He is greater than Abraham. He is greater than the temple. He is greater than all the high priests and sacrifices that were before him. All the signs of Scripture lead to him. He is greater than your traditions. He is greater than your ancestors. He is greater than your ambitions. He is greater than all the prophets. He is greater than all the figures of human history. Greater even than you can imagine. Greater than creation itself. He is the greatest, the most excellent, the most complete an utterly supreme revelation of God because He is God Himself, the radiance of His glory and the exact imprint of His nature. And all that remains to be said then is, how have you responded to Him? Won't you pray with me? Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for revealing yourself to sinners like us, for opening our eyes that we might see the glory of your Son, that we might believe in the work of the cross 
that we might hope in the resurrection and that we might trust in the gospel message. We do pray, Lord, that you would extend your kingdom further by adding more souls to it, calling to those who have heard of these things and yet not believed them, and that you would turn their hearts to yourself, that they might repent and believe and be baptized. In Jesus' name, amen.